Rebecca. Thank you. So interesting and well structured. Um, now I'd like to invite Irene van de Giesen. She wants. Irene, hello. The need for an Odyssean construction of hearing voices. Good morning to you all. I saw Olga had the same pictures, a few of them, we took from the internet. Let's see how this works. After the Trojan War, it took Odysseus ten years to return to the island of Ithaca. His voyage became a symbol of the voyage of life and the personal growth that people may experience. The solution Odysseus found to navigate his ship past the sirens is known as the Odyssean construction. It prevented a premature end of the voyage of him and his crew. He put wax into the ears of his crew members and while one of them took over the helm, the others tied Odysseus to the mast. This way, although he could hear the siren singing, he was not able to steer the ship onto the rocks. This expression, Odyssean construction, is well known even in government circles. When politicians let themselves be lured into compliance with their voters, or the choice for prestigious but expensive and superfluous projects, then it is said that there is need for an Odyssean construction. Ignorance of this audition construction can have devastating consequences. Odysseus had gone through a lot and was in crisis after the Trojan War. Once he had experienced a period in his life in which all this did not exist. Everything he needed he found right at hand, unconditionally. This was the period in which he was a fetus in his mother's belly. Upon his birth, this bliss was abruptly disturbed. His mother's safe presence suddenly was no longer self-evident. A feeling of deficiency and, and, suffer, and suffering grabbed him. When Odysseus was hungry or thirsty, this need was no longer directly met. Sometimes he was left alone, while he himself saw the comfort of others. As a baby, Odysseus strongly relied on his mother for his survival. Deficiencies he reacted on emotionally. In this way, he communicated his feelings to the outer world. He was sad or angry. Odysseus discovered his mother's impatience because there was a lack of time, energy and love to give him as a child unconditionally what he needed. To get things his way, he cried and screamed. This, unfortunately, did not work. He became insecure, restless, experienced emptiness, and no longer knew what to do. Odysseus had no other choice than to develop a, strat a strategy to survive, in an attempt yet to see his needs met. At a certain point, he became angry and annoyed, and strongly made himself hurt. At another, he would be sweet and patient. This way, he tried yet again to get what he needed. This lay the foundation for that which later would be called his personality. But in fact, this was a strategic reaction he unconsciously developed as a baby to have his needs met. Unawares, he continued this reaction throughout his life. His personality was of course also marked by the influence of others in his life. The norms and values influencing the development of his personality he partly inter internalized and in this way he shaped his conscience, his shame and his sense of guilt. In this way, he created an inner critic that was to keep him on the right track and under control. 
that is to say, on the track that his parents and others considered best for him. This personality, this survival strategy he developed as a baby, gave him security and something to hold on. This is simply the way he was, Odysseus assumed. It was his unconscious way to keep or get a grip on difficult situations, on deficiencies. It gave him an identity. Until the war started. Suddenly his grip on life slipped away and he grew insecure. His personality seemed no longer able to, to, to protect him from a crisis. He no longer knew who he actually was. And that was natural given the context of his former personality. In the crisis he went through, his experiences of deficiency in the past strongly surfaced again. He set off on a voyage well known to us. I myself, and this was a picture of when I was in hospital, was also confronted with a severe crisis. In my foster family, the survival strategy I had developed appeared to be inadequate. My inner critic voices attacked me relentlessly and shouted at me all that I had done wrong. They tried to push me back into the precise personality that now no longer offered me any support. The personality I considered myself to be crumbled away and no longer offered me the security it used to. The underlying levels of being came to the surface. Everything I had learned lost its meaning. The crisis I lived through gave me a strong sense of helpless, helplessness and confusion. Intense emotions presented themselves. Values I as an adult had learned long ago, such as taking care of myself, hygiene, social responsibility, responsibility and context dissolved. I neglected myself. I fell back into the stage of a baby, in a way. I was no longer able to care for myself. I refused to take a shower, used the shower floor as a toilet, ate abundantly, and was in permanent fear of death. From this PowerPoint slide, you will understand the great importance of recognizing logic in every crisis. In comparison with the personality develop development I sketched of Odysseus, my crisis went in the opposite direction. This explains why at times I could not understand or describe what was wrong with me. The ability to understand and formulate simply have not developed yet in a baby. Within, within psychiatry, my experiences were disposed of as a disorder. Within five minutes, I was given the diagnosis of schizophrenia. How nice would it have been if this psychiatrist, like Odysseus, had by his personal goddess Circe, had been warned of the lure of passing a diagnosis. If as a preventive measure, measure he would have burned his DSM as not to be confronted later with the negative consequences of the diagnosis he gave me. But maybe that was precisely the problem. My psychiatrist will never be confronted with the consequences of what he did to me. He did not, as Odysseus did, run the risk of striking a rock with his ship. It was me who struck the rock. Never mind that he had been lured by the lies he had heard as a student about the connection between hearing voices and schizophrenia. And never mind that he had been lured by the pharmaceutical industry into prescribing expensive and eventually ineffective medication. Neither does it matter that he had even been lured by me, the people close to me, and society into the trap of giving an all-encompassing answer to my unbearable suffering. What followed was 20 years of antipsychotics and a message that there was no hope. 
medication was to calm, calm me down. Once I was calm, again, people tried to restore my old personality and to see to it that I found grip on things again. The crisis seemed to have passed. But of course, this house of cards also collapsed when I was confronted again with the same sense of deficiency. <coughs> when I was confronted with the same sense of deficiency. With my newly acquired personality too, these feelings continued deep down and came to the surface in periods of insecurity. Something changed fundamentally when with the help of a coach, I learned to place the feelings of deficiency that surfaced in a crisis and the wide range of reactions I showed in a wider scope. Luckily, my foster father, who is also here or somewhere, uh, did not think my crisis was that strange. He did not let himself be lured by my defiant behavior. I did behave strangely, but according to him, that was not strange at all, seeing what I had gone through. Together with my coach, he taught me something I would grant everyone, his or her own audition construction. I learned I was strong, for, I, for if I had been weak, I would have protested far less fiercely against my crisis. The one thing I had to do was to observe unconditionally and without judging the characteristics of my crisis. In this way, I avoided the stereotype assumption that the crisis was by definition bad. Besides fighting, fleeing or paralysis, I learned a fourth possibility. And that was I could bring my conscience to the surface. For fighting, fleeing or freezing into paralysis are survival strategies. The fourth possibility was freedom. Four steps were essential in the process. The first one was that I no longer concentrated on the person or the situation that seemed to have caused the crisis, but rather started focusing on what happened inside to, of me, irrespective of what had been the cause. I asked myself what my attitude was toward my emotions and that which I had experienced. I learned to observe with a friendly attention. It was no longer clear what was right or wrong, as when a heart attack leads to a beautiful nearly death experience, so I realized there was more than just my crisis. I learned to catch the tiny ray of hope that shines through all black and heavy panic in a crisis. In this way, space and distance were set between me and my feelings that shortly before had threatened to engulf me. That was who I really was, no matter how badly I had been harmed. This distance, however, was not sufficient, for at times this even enhanced my feelings. By accepting my feelings unconditionally, I gained much information about what had driven me into the crisis about my attitude towards the crisis and about how I was to arrive at my own being. With the second step, I learned to tune in on my emotions. Coming into motion and getting acquainted with my inner child was needed here. I became aware of the influence the world outside had on me. Eventually, I had to admit that it made no sense fighting my past. It had happened anyway. What helped was to focus on my reactions themselves. I learned that the way I perceived the outside world was a projection of my inner world. This was the third step. I also began to understand why a certain incident for one person leads to a crisis and for another does not. It was remarkable how the same patterns kept returning in crisis. I was not by far any better than Pavlov's dog. Just like this dog, I kept reacting in the same way when I was in crisis. This formed the starting point of a conscious break with my crisis. Standing up for myself was important in this. 
I discovered the shadow sides of my personality. The immense aggression I sometimes felt proved to be a precursor that told me I had allowed people to dis disrespect my limits. The outside world held up a perfect mirror for me, through which I consciously learned to challenge my shadow sides. Finally, I hit the road, the road of my being, my essence. This road was a road for dedication to whatever happened in my life. More and more, I took my own position and place in the world. This connected me with a sense of freedom and a larger consciousness, a, a space from which all that holds form and content is born. In the fourth step, I learned that my personality did not give me the grip I had hoped for. It was not geared to cope with the natural stream of life in which things come and go. It desired security and stability translated into concrete things. From the essence within me, I learned to smile about all these things. Not because I deemed them unimportant, but because I learned to see through them. I learned to see what I was looking for in the outside world. I needed only to sit down and fully accept my hopes, desires and expectations to experience that the deepest feeling of happiness, fulfillment and contentment was to be found within myself. By constantly focusing on the outside world, I turned around in circles of deficiency and deprivation. My voyage of life is for that reason really quite simple. It's finding what makes me most happy and content. Odysseus also discovered this on his voyage. He followed the same four steps. He paid attention to Circe's words about the sirens. He turned in on his emotions involved in this and realized that he would probably not be able to resist the sirens. For the outside world had already held up a mirror for him, showing him his Pavlov reaction to singing women in bird-like shapes. He knew himself in this way and he knew he was capable of doing strange things in certain situations. To have himself tied down was the only way. Tied to the mast, he learned to smile about the assumptions he had of the role these women could play in his life. He learned to smile about his own plea to his crew to set him free and about the necessity to keep him tied down. He could do no more than turn his view inside and beware that all he needed was present inside himself, that he need not have himself tied down. The next day, having safely passed the sirens, he was happy for it. I wish for you, and not in the last place for myself, that we will pay due attention to the sirens we come across in our lives, to tune in and to realize that what the outside world and we ourselves think of the sirens will influence us. A smile, patience and a few inside ourselves to get to know the sirens, this is the only road open to us. Thank you.